So thanks for thanks for having me this morning. You know, we're we're in a you know how to say this. We're in this incredibly unique time in the world. Uh, there's as the saying goes, there are we can go decades where very little change happens, and then there are days and times where you know decades take place, uh, and and we are seeing so much incredible change happen right before us. You know, we have COVID-19 that's taking place. We have really a deep introspection, not just here in the United States, but around the world, asking questions about what is it, racism? What is the different aspects of how this has impacted people? What is our responsibility to make not only amends, but how do we lift up everyone together? What does it look like to be truly a global community? when we can't travel, but yet we can interact like we are right now, virtually fully connected and really be right in front of each other in, in real time. There's, this, there's so much taking place. It, it's, it's really astounding. And so what I thought might be useful just to start with is kind of talk a little bit about what I've been up to, how I'm spending my time, and then really kind of talk about a few of the different things that I think are really salient for us as data scientists together. And then really kind of keep most of the time open, honestly, for a Q&A, because I think most of the things that we need to have these days is fundamentally dialogue. We need to find new ways to talk to each other, to bridge the gap and really engage with each other. And with that is be able to question each other, be able to push each other to be better, to find our flaws, find our collective biases, and then work together to not only mitigate them, but to overcome them because we make it a cooperative effort. So what have I been up to? Now, I'm about finishing up 14 weeks where I've been on leave from my normal day job, which is at Devoted Health, where I'm responsible for technology, data, and, uh, and relevant systems. And I've been focused up in Sacramento, which is the state capital of California, to really help on COVID. And so 14 weeks ago, we a team of us said, hey, probably could use some extra help. I know this is a challenging time. And so what if we brought our collective skills together? And so we just drove up to Sacramento and started helping out. And in that time, we've really been focused on trying to understand not only how COVID moves in a society, but how do we think about the mitigating characteristics of COVID? That really ties into modeling. And what does it actually look like to build a model for COVID? For those that may follow Amazon and, uh, and Werner Vogel, uh, Werner Vogel was nice enough to write a blog post about our efforts and where we had a team of data scientists, really Josh Wills and Sam Shaw, combined with some researchers out of John Hopkins University to really come together to take what is uh, a, a solid epidemiological model and make it that much more powerful. And they did this by first asking, what does it take to take it out of the lab and put it on production hardware, put it into the environments that we might expect a, a normal company or consumer internet company or enterprise internet company to be using. And they took that and they did it in record time. And the time to actually run the models went from three to four days, five days, roughly, you know, kind of a work week and got it to run in under 30 minutes. And that allows us to then suddenly do scenarios test out ideas. What does it mean if we have people shelter in place, people physically distancing? What is the impact of mass? What is it? all these kind of questions? We can start asking what these are to get an insight of what we need to do. That model is now not, is, is open source. It's available to everybody. And that combined effort has really changed the game in terms of what people can do. We not only that, but this question of assessing how do we actually understand additional impacts of COVID? We know COVID impacts populations in different ways. One is the older you are, the more at risk you are, as well as if you have any other kind of ailments or what we call comorbidities. If you have diabetes or other type of health issues, that's gonna be a challenge as well. And so how do we collectively work on these things and try to understand those impacts? Some of that requires different ways to get data to bring data in from hospitals or different areas and really ask ourselves what's needed to really find and assess COVID. Because COVID takes a long time to, before it manifests in, this, uh, in, in, a, in a population. And so those efforts have really would have helped power not just California, but many of the other states in the United States and internationally about how to think about COVID. Because why? We're data scientists. We share 
We collaborate, we talk to each other, we have a community. And so while it may seem oftentimes that we're working in this small vacuum defined by political or geographic boundaries, data science is a movement. And all of us are on this collective team. And so when we talk and we share our ideas and say, hey, are you thinking about this? Or what about this? I'm able to borrow ideas from others and others hopefully will borrow ideas from me. And together we collectively figure out how to work on COVID. Why is this so critical now? You know, here in the United States, we have, we're approaching almost 120,000 dead uh, due to COVID. We know that impact around the world is just devastating. And it's very easy to think about COVID and just say that number. It's very easy to say cases are on the rise or this many people died today. That's somebody's friend. That's somebody's grandparents or parents. It's a colleague, it's a worker, it's a loved one. They deserve better than to be called a statistic. They deserve better than just to be remembered as some data point on a graph. We have to remember the names. And that's the most important thing that I can tell you is that data points have names. And when we take away the names and we forget about the stories, we take away something that is the most intrinsic value we have, which is our humanity. And when we take away that humanity, that's when we make mistakes and use data in ways that actually marginalize or harm populations. So what are those names? Find out their stories. Who are they? It's very easy to become numb to the pain. But every person, every data point has a story, it has a name, and behind that story has a life of meaning. And we have a responsibility to that. And that is the power that we fundamentally have, which then turns into what are we gonna do about it? And that raises a question of what does it actually mean to build a technology that is radical and revolutionary? And I would assert that a technology is neither ra radical nor revolutionary unless it benefits every single person. We see unbelievable technology out there. You know, we're using it right now. But I, there's so many people out there that don't have access to it. There's so many people that are can't get it because they don't have access to a computer or Wi-Fi or maybe they just are stuck behind a paywall. What are we going to do about that? It's not just sufficient to say, oh, we're working within our own little office, our own walls, or within our own little group on you know, whatever messaging client you want to use. We've got to move beyond that. We have to ask ourselves, how do we take more people along this journey with us? We have to find somebody else that that's, doesn't have access like we do and pull them along. And when we're building that, we have to ask, how are we actually ensuring this works for everybody? Every single person, what would that look like to build for them? And when we talk about everyone, project who are those people. Find out, talk to them, engage with them. The most powerful things for me that have ever happened in data science aren't about the algorithms. It's about understanding who is impacted by the algorithms and understanding, are we doing right by them? Or are we doing harm by them? And what are we gonna do tomorrow to make it even better? That leads to this next part, which is that we really need to ensure that data science is a team sport. Right now, it's very easy to say, very oh, easy to say I'm oh, this kind of data scientist, I'm or I'm this kind of data scientist, scientist. I work on AI, I work on BI. All these different ways. Great, have those skills. You know what? If we're playing soccer, we need to have people who are playing every role, or for everyone who's international football. We have to have somebody who's the striker, we have to have the fullback, we have to have all those different positions. The same is true on theater or in dance or in any other activity. You can have the person who's on the stage, but where's the audio? Where's the music? Where's the performers? Where's the rehearsals? Where's the practice? All the infrastructure. It's very easy to see me up here and doing all this talking. What you don't see behind the scene is how much work this team is actually doing to make this happen. 
What about them? They're part of this team. They're critical. Without them, nothing would happen. Same way when we have a conference and we're actually meeting in person. Somebody's cleaning up that room. They're on the team too. So my request, my ask is let's make our team bigger. When we make it bigger, we'll make it better. This is a we activity. If your team is just people like you who come from the same backgrounds, look the same, had the same education, find somebody who's different. Find somebody, maybe if you're a team of women, find a man. If it's a team of men, find a woman. If you're one you know, political party, find somebody else. If you're, find, you know, every different way, find somebody who's unique. One of the most fortunate experiences I ever had is when I was in, when I was in uh, President Obama's White House uh, and on his administration, in his, in his administration. And in the morning meeting, just before the, the president gets to the Oval Office, there's a kickoff meeting that's, that's there in, right outside the Oval Office in what's called the Roosevelt Room, where the chief of staff gets everyone together to kind of talk through key issues of the day. And you look around that room, and it was amazing. You'd see all the different beautiful colors of race. You'd see different religions represented. You'd see different sexual orientations represented. It was truly a room that reflected the diversity of the country. What would it look like if our teams look like that? Because I can't tell you how many times in that room somebody said something that changed my entire worldview. Where they might say, have you thought about, and then they fill in a blank. And I just had no idea. It was just so, so powerful for people to know, for me to understand what their lives were like. I'd never been in a physically inside a jail. And so when Lynn Overman, who was on our our criminal justice team and a former uh, public defender, took me to visit a a jail, I had no idea. But coming out of that experience, it transformed my view of why we need radical transformation of our criminal justice system here in the United States and really around the world. Because what I got to see in talking to people who had been incarcerated is that they weren't the only ones serving time. Their families were serving time. Their children were serving time. And we had to find a better way so their children did not serve a penalty to society. And I'm not claiming that all these people are innocent or good. What I am saying is that no child should be penalized for something their parents have done. That led to a wide array of projects that involved data and technology, one of which was the Data Driven Justice Initiative. And if you follow me on Medium or LinkedIn, you've probably seen some of my posts on trying to understand what's going on in our country around the questions of racial inequality or different issues and why we actually launched some of these programs. And and if you're interested, there's a speech that I just gave a couple days ago as a commencement speech that talks about these issues in more detail, but happy to go into them in more in question. But my point, broader point is make your team bigger, make your team broader. And this is going to be a challenge when we can't physically interact, we can't sit down and share a coffee, we do lose something. So we can just sit in our homes and say, woe is me, or complain and just get get angry, or we can do something about it. We can write code, we can work on projects together, we can find data sets together, you can volunteer. Some of you might just roll up your sleeves and just walk into your local state government, your local community government and say, I'm here to help. Can you use my skills? They may not know what to do with you right away, but if you just start finding a way to add value, you will fundamentally change the impact that you are having on society. And that's fundamentally the most important thing. So let me wrap it up there with the final part of just saying thank you for being here. Thank you for working so much in the areas of data. And let's continue to focus on these big questions that are coming. 
because we have to focus not only on the big things, we have to figure out how do we make ourselves better? How do we use our skills to do more powerful things? And it really comes down to, at the end of the day, how are we going to use this technology to really lift up everybody fundamentally? Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, DJ. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk and, and great to see you again. Thank you for making it mm -hmm. uh, to this event. Very, very excited. Um, I love what you said about um, uh, data points have names that I actually felt emotion in that time. I think that uh, it's a very true reality that we don't face all the time. What's, what would you say an individual contributing data scientist can do? What kind of first step can they take to recognizing? Like sometimes we, some, the reality is we have to work with lots of data and uh, we can't, uh, sometimes we can't, don't even have access to the personalized information, it's desensitized. What can an individual data scientist do to uh, at least be aware of the issue or the situation that they're dealing with, not just data points, but probably with people's names? Mm -hmm. You know, so interestingly, working in the healthcare space, one of the really big challenges of this is, is that it, it's hard because of security and privacy concerns to know exactly who this is and what this impact is. But if you know where the data is from and, and or the, the region and where it's impacted, and let's suppose it's a hospital, what if we just called up the hospital and said, tell me what it's like? Find somebody who's there. Maybe there's a data scientist in that region or somebody who has a friend or a family member who will talk to you about what it's like there, What give you context, share more. You know, there's this whole idea in design of user-centered research, which really is go out and find people and try to make a connection. And luckily, if you say, hey, I'm trying to do this with data, could you help me understand how, what it's like for you, that's really powerful. So for example, in my case, one of the things I've been working on is the idea of skilled nursing facilities. Here in the United States, these are our, 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 our facilities where somebody may have broken a hip or may have had some other issue. They're not in the hospital, but they're in this facility where they need rehabilitation or other types of things. It tends to be for elderly care. And so how do you understand what that is? So one of the things that I was fortunate to do to really get a, my, my head wrapped around this was to talk to some nurses um, who had been in, you know, spent their careers in skilled nursing facilities to understand. One of the things I didn't fully appreciate when they did this is they talked to me about the, the protective gear, what we call the personal protective equipment, PPE. And they talked about how, you know, it's very easy to go from room to room. And if you're not doing good control of PPE, the gown, the mask, the, the goggles, all of this, you can very quickly get yourselves, you're going to contaminate other people. They also pointed out that the staffing and the way these systems work is, is so complex, it's very hard to constantly change your gear. It's just very hard because people are close together and you have to kind of move from one bed to another if people are having issues. And every time you change that gear, it takes, a, it takes like a minute or two to put it all back on. And, you, and then if you're going to go back to the other patient, you have to take it all off and put it back on. And so you, it, the realization was, wait, we need, to, we need to structure the skilled nursing facilities differently. The layout needs to be different. In the question of opening up restaurants, one of the things that I was able to do was... I just went to restaurants and I talked to the people and I said, tell me what it's like. And, you know, one of the things they talked about is they said for gloves, wearing gloves. And they said, and masks and face shields. And they said, you know, we're working in a kitchen where if I'm over this grill, it fogs up right away. And I can't actually, you know, the heat is so much that the gloves don't really work. And I can't get the, the better quality gloves. So I need a solution here. And, and that is something I never would have expected until I actually visited or I found people that could tell me. Now, some of the places I couldn't find, so in terms of talking to, to about opening up barber shops or hairstylists, I just called my, my barber up and I asked her, I said, hey, can you help me understand what this is like for you? And could you put me in contact with a few of your friends at other places 
just to help me understand what it's like and what the confusion was. And so they helped share all this information with me. But the part of this that was the most important one that, that I would tell, tell you that resonated with me that I didn't see coming, bring this back to the healthcare side, was talking to one of um, the nurses in skilled nursing facilities and to how she told me was they're not supposed to really spend that much time with patients right now if they're, if they're dying with COVID because of the risk for themselves. And how what she told me is she can't not do that. She can't have someone die and not be holding their hand as they die. And that is something that I never thought about in that level of depth. And she humanized it. And it's very easy for us to talk about the probability and say, just don't be next to somebody. But asking this question of what does it mean to actually keep a person safe so that somebody also has dignity in death, that's a question I'm still struggling with. And how do we actually develop good policy rather than just thinking of it as some kind of curve that says your risk is going up? That's, that, there's got to be ways for us to think through those issues. Thank you. That's, that's very deep. Um, thank you for illustrating that. Uh, we're going to move on to questions. Uh, so if you have questions for DJ, this is a great opportunity to ask them. Please put them into the stage uh, chat and our moderators will fill them, filter them. And we already have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so Bernard asks, um, how you, you speak about sharing and being close together. How, do this, how does this global paradigm work in the face of aggressive economic and nation state competitions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a great question. You know, it's very easy for us to talk about just winning the public health war, but we could lose, we could lose the economic war. And, and the economic challenges are material. And, and many of the programs that we have seen start to work, not just in the United States, but around the world, you know, they're at risk. And that risk is a generational impact. That's getting people educated, getting people to schools, getting people immunized early on for, for measles and uh, cholera and other things that will be massive setbacks, uh, malaria eradication programs. The dollars that fund those, those activities uh, are, are driven off our economics. And, and if we're not careful, we lose the chance to, to really to fund those things. And so we have a struggle because we have to, we have to win on both of those, those challenges. We have to win on, on both of those fights. And I think this is very early. You know, one of the things that people talk about is COVID and, you know, wave one, wave two, wave three, what I think, I, well, at least when I look at COVID, the way I think about it is we're in the very early beginnings of COVID. I really think of it as almost three phases. The first phase was very much just keep the hospital systems up and give, give it time, give people time to get the hospital beds, the ICU capacity, the critical care units, get the, the, the staff and get the learning for actually management of COVID. And just keep those systems up. And we've seen what's happened in Italy, what's happened in New York, Wuhan. Uh, we're seeing what's happening in, in uh, South America the, the, and, and so much of the rest of the world where these outbreaks are getting, getting ahead of us. Two, the so second phase is really getting ready for the transition between knowing that there's the systems can stay up to the phase three, which is... What is this going to look like for long-term management of COVID? You know, it's, it's stunning that we are having this political debate around masks, given the efficacy that we're seeing. We're having people question or undermine the data. We have misinformation and disinformation campaigns taking place to undermine us being unified in our approach for public health. And we're going to have a challenge that once we have a vaccine, how do we ensure that we get enough people inoculated so that we can actually have herd immunity? 
all of this has to happen in the backdrop that people need a way to have good supply chains for food. People have to have a place to sleep. We have to have all those other pieces. And the international national component of this is a further challenge because we have seen activities that make me very sad, such as calling this virus a China virus or labeling certain populations as the primary instigators of of these activities. I fundamentally reject those attempts. And I think we all owe it to our to each other and as our societies to rise above that. The part there that I think is going to be needed is also for us to recognize that COVID is not the big one. This is not influenza. This isn't drug, tuber uh, drug resistant tuberculosis or anything else. And the systems that we put in are now going to be the foundation of a public health system that is going to be absolutely needed in the face of increased uh, uh, disease vectors that are really driven not only by climate change, but a denser, a denser metropolitan populations as, and uh, the ability to travel, uh, a globally connected world. And so we need to get all these pieces together. And it's very early. The economic modeling is, is showing that we don't even know how to put economic and pandemic modeling, epidemiological modeling together. It's an open space to start bringing these two fields together. We need new data institutes that are going to bring this data together in novel ways. Oh, there's, there's so much there. And, and I'll just kind of, I know I'm going on a bit here, but the, one of the things that's fascinating is if you look at the San Francisco Bay Area and why did San Francisco Bay Area do better than New York or in LA, one of the things that's really fascinating is by looking at data from restaurant receipts. And you see that restaurant receipts really started to drop off very early, seven to 10 days before, as well as businesses had, uh, uh, because of the tech ecosystem here, had already started to say, stay at home. So they already were physically distancing. And so effectively, the Bay Area had shut down and moved to a shelter in place model that really helped it avoid the challenges, many of which you're seeing in the Los Angeles region or that what we saw in New York. And so those give us insights in powerful ways, but that's not coming off of public data. It's coming off of data from, from um, OpenTable and other places. And we have to find and be creative in those approaches. Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, it sounds like the, it sounds like an interesting economic model that the less we think about competition, the more we think about the community as a whole, the more successful we are. So. It just, I guess, companies can lead by example by doing that. All right. right. Uh, next question from Ken Pierce. We are seeing governments start to offer contact tracing apps that run in the background to help contain the spread of COVID-19. This same technology can obviously be used in troubling ways. What do you feel is the best way to balance personal privacy issues versus public health risk in the face of global pandemic? Mm -hmm. So there's two parts of this, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be releasing a paper very soon about my lessons learned for uh, uh, COVID and working on it and what my policy recommendations are. So those will hopefully come out in, uh, in, in rather soon. One of the sections that I've really kind of focused on is really about how apps won't save the day, but they're really necessary to help gain efficiencies and scale. And so there's multiple parts in this. One part is these apps that are really might be characterized as symptom trackers to just help uh, groups know where, where the uh, early indicators of COVID are taking place. Some of this like that looks potentially interesting is wearables. Obviously, there's a price question in there and accessibility. Does do, you know, do populations have access to that? Uh, another is contact tracing and how do you actually execute on just the, the management of contact tracing? And how do you build uh, superpowers, if you will, to, to, to help make people do contact tracing just more efficient? And that's just the ability to, you know, how do you do record management? In Ebola, one of the most powerful technologies that, that was there was the shared spreadsheets, Google Sheets versus passing uh, at that time, you know, files, CSV files uh, around by, by email. Just having that, that collaborative allowed us to enter data in real time. So having those platforms. And then there's the contact tracing 
that the components of the Bluetooth and GPS uh, technologies of how to actually know if you've exp been exposed, what are referred to as exposure apps. And there's other forms of this where you check in with QR codes or other things. There's a number of challenges with the Bluetooth apps, including false positives uh, and the impact of false positives and telling a population to say, hey, you got to, you, you know, you can't work now and may, that may risk their jobs and all of those things. There's a whole nother side that you're bringing up, which is also important, which is how do we actually ensure good privacy and, and protections? And we're seeing a very challenging aspect. And I'll lay out two arguments. The first is after uh, what we've seen that was done after the attacks in, to the United States uh, of 9-11. And the attacks that happened there and the activities to really deal with Al-Qaeda uh, and then later on ISIS required uh, you know, a number of technologies being put in place to, to monitor and access things. Those were put in legally. And when they were put in legally after uh, Edward Snowden kind of uh, disclosed a bunch of things, the, po the US population said, hey, I didn't think that's what we signed up for. And so you very quickly can move from a place where you have good, you, you have laws that are passed but you have technology that has implications that people are not aware of. And so how do we have that good debate about what is the impact of technology? That has to happen now because we made that mistake before and without ensuring good civil protections. It's very easy right now in public health to just say, we need full surveillance and we need access to where everybody is without the necessary protections. And we, I believe we can have both. You can actually have both. You can have strong protections. You can do these things, but it's not going to be easy. And maybe we need different systems, different places, different things. But this is going to take a combination of good policy people working really hand in hand with technologists. You can't just have a table of policy people coming up with things or a table of technology people coming up with solutions. You got to do it together. And you have to do it with the population of people who are impacted, the communities that are gonna be disproportionately impacted. And we've seen that right now, even with protests around the world where people are starting to use technologies in ways that are quite dubious. The other part of this is how do we structure public health? In the United States, we slammed all these organizations after 9-11 together to create the Department of Homeland Security. We need to ask ourselves, how do we design public health to ensure that it can not only capture data, bring and align the bureaucracies of, of governments while simultaneously ensuring that there's strong civil rights involved in here. And we're seeing questions out of or, uh, places in other parts of the world, uh, China, uh, uh, as well as the Middle East, where tech, some of that technology is being used to accelerate surveillance in those communities. And that is gonna be another challenge that we have to have. So what would I recommend for all of us? We need to get involved now. We need to start having those discussions. We need to educate people about the implications. And when we design these systems, we need to design these systems in a way that takes responsibility for our actions by asking what happens if somebody is flagged or somebody's indicated or how harm might be happening. Uh, there's a book that Hillary Mason, Mike Lucchese, and I wrote about data and ethics. It's free on Amazon or O'Reilly. You can go grab it. And it talks about a series of steps that you can do from everything from red teaming to other activities to actually ensure that we're going to build these technologies with good safeguards. Fantastic. I think a lot of people with what's happening in the world right now um, are questioning their own uh, values, morals, ethics, which is normal. These uh, the world changes all the time. So having some guiding principle like that would be valuable, very valuable to people. Can you tell us what the name of the book is, just so for those interested, you can check it out. Sure. If you just do a search for uh, data and ethics uh, uh, in my name uh, in Hillary Mason, you'll you'll find the book. Uh, but I think we titled it something very very powerful, like. Data ethics <laughs> or data science and ethics. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was the, the, the genesis and the manifestation of why we wrote it is there's lots of really good research being done around how do we make systems fair, accountable, all, all uh, you know, responsible systems. 
our approach was as practitioners and being responsible for data teams and technologies was to really ask the question, what would it take for us to implement these ideas into our teams? And what have we done in the past? What would we wish we do more of? And we did a kind of brainstorming exercise with a number of friends to really capture those. One of the very powerful ones is borrowing from the aviation industry as well as uh, um, uh, is in healthcare and a tool uh, uh, Gwande wrote about this in his book, The Checklist Manifesto, and really asking what's a checklist for us? When we build a system or an algorithm, can we, do we have a checklist? Some of those checklist items are very easy, which is, you know, who owns this algorithm after we've launched it? Have we actually talked to people who will be impacted? Do we have recourse if harm is created? Do we ta have we ensured that we don't have bias or have we found mitigating controls for our bias? Just a checklist and a red, you know, followed by a red teaming exercise where you ask, what are all the things that could go wrong? And then asking, do we have good risk mitigation? Those are, these are very lightweight, very simple things that could be implemented that I believe are very powerful in the process of actually building and conducting data science for mass, making sure we're on the right side of this equation. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to ask everybody on this uh, watching this, if you're a manager, read the book. If you are an individual contributor, take the book to your manager because we need to solve this ethics problem. Thank you. And I'll, I'll post it on my. Uh, I'll post it uh, in a little bit on my Twitter feed again, uh, and tag tag the the conference. Uh, and it's it's the best part. Free. Our goal is not to make money or do anything off of it. It's just a practitioner handbook. And you can follow me at at first initial D and then my last name P A T I L or on LinkedIn. I'll post it there as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Um, next question is from Baharech. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Golfar. Uh, data analysis results can be interpreted in so many different ways, not always the way that, we, the, that they are meant to be. Do you have any recommendations on how to minimize the possibility of our analysis being interpreted wrongly or used in a way that we don't want? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's the number of times I've dealt with this on a day, day-to-day -day basis is phenomenal. And we're seeing so much of that happening right now just around COVID. Uh, where people are questioning assumptions. And the biggest, most important thing that I, I would say, that there's, there's first three things I try to, try to have all my teams and data scientists really implement when we're working with a presentation around data, a graphic, or anything that is going to be communicated out. The first one is asking the question of, what do we want people to take away? Like, what's, what's the takeaway from this, this, this graph? Two, what is the action we want them to take? Do we want them to share it? Do we want them to, to, uh, to, to um, look at something new? Do we want them to, put, to, to do their own research? What are all the things we want them to do? And the third one is the one that we most often leave out, which is how do we want people to feel? And we think of it as like we shouldn't have emotion. We're data scientists. The data should not supposed to have emotion. But when you're creating data and you're, you're producing these things. The goal is communication. The goal is to communicate a result and help people understand it. So, you know, the, the biggest pain point I, I see is when people put up a graph and then they say, as you can see, how many times have we seen somebody says, as you can see in the graph? And I usually say, I don't know what you see. I see <laughs> what I see. Tell me what I should be seeing from through your eyes. Help me understand your perspective. What am I, should I be angry about this? Should I be thrilled? What, what, what is, what do you want me to do? And, and make it easy for people to know what you are thinking and where you are trying to go. It begins with communication. The second is find ways to be in the room when it's being explained. And this is one of the hardest things. You have to find a way to get into the room. You're a data scientist. They're going to want somebody smart in the room. And they oftentimes say, well, sorry, you know, this is the room where decisions make happen. you got to find a way to break into that. There's, and that is very hard. I don't want to give any illusions. But you have to be there to help give caveats. And it's very easy for us to give caveat after caveat after caveat and not help the discussion move forward. You have to find a way to help everyone see the balance, the challenges, the nuances, 
and move the discussion forward with your results. And that's going to start minimizing the gap of how people misinterpret. And then when people misinterpret, don't get mad. It's so easy to just get pissed off and be like, ah, oh, these people, how can they do it? I can't believe it. They haven't done the, the result. No, that's a failure more often than not on our ability to actually figure out how to communicate it. Now, there are going to be people who are going to intentionally misconstrue things, but we need to figure out how to bridge that gap and work on those things. When I give a talk or anything, I go through at least two practice talks. When I was training as a graduate student, I had to go through at least two practice talks with my colleagues before I presented to, to uh, the faculty. And then I was allowed to give the talk externally. And boy, were we hard on each other, constructively hard, not demeaning hard. We we're hard on each other, like saying, you know what, I can't, I don't think I follow you. I, I, I think people are going to get confused here. This graph, the, the, the lettering is too small. Uh, you know, is there a better, maybe what if we try to explain it this way? Those small things go a long way. So whenever you're producing something, get friends to help. Get your team to, to, to push you to, to figure out those flaws. What could, where could this go wrong? What could you do to be better? That's what's going to make this, that, that's the biggest, most important thing that I have found to make this to communicate hard, complicated things in a way that isn't going to get misconstrued or lead to bad results. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I love that, especially the advice about being in the room when something has been explained. Absolutely agree. It's, uh, it's sometimes extremely hard, for, especially if you're a junior data scientist, to get in there, but you got you to gotta do it. Like, um, as much as it, it's your responsibility, it's your duty to be there. And... And speaking, commenting on what you said about um, making people feel the third step, I was actually uh, just recently reading, I found out that if the part of the brain is damaged that is responsible for emotions, a human can rationalize decisions, but they can't make the decision. So ultimately, decisions are driven not by rationale, but by emotions. So making somebody feel something, as you said absolutely correctly, is imperative, and a data scientists should be able to do that. Thank you. For can, I, can I add one thing here? For those that are trying to figure out how to hack into the room, this is a game of trust. You know, you don't get into a room just because you're like, I'm the data scientist. Sometimes you can because people are just like, oh, we need somebody smart. Sometimes that works, but that won't work for every room. You have to find it a way and you, you have to ask yourself what is required so that people feel that if you're not in the room, they can't do a good job. That they look around, like, you know, when the meeting happens, they go, where is, where is Sally? Where is Enrique? Uh, you know, they, they go, this, this, is, this is ridiculous. Why, why aren't they here? We, we need, you have to find what does it take for that. And the first thing that's there is, is trust. People have to trust you. And the, the way to start with trust when you're a data scientist is to solve a problem for somebody. Find something that the group or the team, some pain, some pain point. What's a pain point? And figure it out in a way that takes away all, all their issues. When I first got to uh, uh, LinkedIn and I visited our customer service center in, in, uh, uh, in the middle of the United States, and one, one of the things that I did was I was trying to understand for the team, I was like, tell me about your biggest pain points. And one of the biggest pain points turned out that they were getting all this spam through all these email relays. And I thought, well, that's weird. Why, why would you have that? That seems super strange. And so I just said, hey, can we just do a grep on the code base and look for any email that was at LinkedIn.com? And we found all these emails that were old deprecated things that were open that people were just emailing in and overloading the, the email queues for, for the, um, the customer service agents. And I said, well, we'll just all route that now to here. And that little bit took away a bunch of what I might characterize as stupid pain was not a good use of their time. When I got into this case of working with COVID in the government, I'll tell you one of the biggest impacts that I believe I had is making a data dictionary. <laughs> I have all this data coming in. It's really powerful. It's great. 
but nobody had actually created a data dictionary to help everyone else do it. So we said, well, what if we made a data dictionary and just updated it every so often so people know what's going on? And then people were like, whoa, you have this data? Oh, and I can use this thing? And suddenly it kind of took off. It's finding that pain. Now, once I've done that, people are like, oh, well, let's have, let's have, can we have more time? Can we have more help? Because you added value. And it's not just me because of, you know, I had this former fancy title. That may help a little bit. That may carry you a little bit more. But really what at the end of the day is that you actually delivered something for somebody. And now they can say, wow, could we have more time? Could we have more help? Would you spend a little bit more time with us? That's the number one thing I'm looking for in a conversation is how can I help you? What can I do to give you more than I'm taking away from this conversation? If you follow with that, you will build trust and people will automatically pull you into meetings. And then you're going to have the problem that you're going to have too many meetings. <laughs> Good problem to have. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, this one is from Pavan Shetty. Uh, is there any formal organization governing the right practices followed in data science? And if so, who? There isn't yet. Um, it's a great question. Like, what is, what's our model? There's a number of groups who are working on things around artificial intelligence and trying to, trying to figure out uh, how do you actually make responsible artificial intelligence. There's, there's, uh, there, there's several of them. They're all quite good. Uh, what does it mean for ethics and data, I think, is an open one. We don't actually have that group yet. Uh, EFF was one of those that has been doing a bunch in this space. There's, there's other community groups that's there. But I think we need to figure out what is, what's going to be the right form of this and what, is, what are those principles. Now, the natural question is, why haven't we just gone and formed it? And I think part of it is we have to figure out how to make this actually very regional first. How do we actually figure out what's needed for our local communities? And I think it's very easy to do this from a top down, but the power of data science is fundamentally that this has been an organic movement. Never expected data science to take off this way. I think it's more that it's a reflection that we're seeing all these things come together and it's really driven by us collectively. It's a movement. Movements work best when we put some of these organizational structures in. And so hopefully one of you out here on this call maybe feels inspired enough to actually go do that and start putting those things in because we need more, more collection, more efforts to bring these things up. And I don't see why that prevents any one of you can be that person that actually carries that baton forward and is the light that that it, and beacon for the rest of us. It's interesting. So when you wrote that uh, uh, Harvard Business Review article with um, uh, Tom Davenport, uh, data scientist, the sexiest profession of the 21st uh, century, uh, you didn't expect data science to become what it is now. No, I, you know, when we first did data science, the, the data scientist thing, li literally when we, you know, the, the story goes that Jeff Hammerbacher and I were trading notes. Jeff was running the, the, the team at Facebook. I was running the data team at LinkedIn. And, you know, we had to come up with titles for our teams and, and because we were both getting ready for the IPOs of the respective companies and you have to get HR in order. And we had all these titles. Some people were, you know, data analysts. Some people were BI specialists. There was all sorts of titles. And so, you know, we kind of came up with a list of what should we call ourselves and we looked at the list and you kind of go, huh, uh, like scientists, and that kind of felt a little too academic, research scientists, no, it didn't quite fit. You know, if we we're going to call ourselves statisticians, we probably would have made the economists angry and vice versa. And, you know, it, it, nothing quite fit. And so the kind of the last one was data scientists. Well, luckily we were LinkedIn and so we had all these job postings. So we really literally posted all the jobs for, for to the company LinkedIn uh, to on the data team as all these different jobs. And the one place where everyone applied that, that had the greatest percentage of applications was to the job posting with the term data scientist. And so that's why we called ourselves data scientists. We literally data science our way into this, if you will, <laughs> of trying to figure this out. And, you know, what I think the reason it took off, one is because, uh, 
LinkedIn and Facebook became really powerful platforms and got, people got to see the power of data. But two is, honestly, people don't know what it means. Like, like what, what, what is a data scientist? And, and the beauty of that means that somebody can't put you in a box because there's nothing better than someone says, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to be this kind of person. When you're a data scientist, they're like, oh, you must be smart. Good, we need more smart people. Uh, if you were kind of like around the table and you're like the data scientist, they're like, great. If they're like, you're the BI analyst, they're like, why are you here? So using the term data scientist, I think is something that gravitated for us as at the same time as data was being opened up, cloud was becoming viable, new algorithms were, were there. And so that is what's really powered us as a community uh, really forward to make this this happen. And, and it's, I think, why we've embraced it. And it, I think when Tom and I were writing that article of data scientists being the sexiest job of the 21st century, really is a reflection of data, data and combined with technology is everything. But we're about to see a new wave of talent, new wave of people who are inspired to use the skills of many disciplines in a truly interdisciplinary approach to really build things and study things in a novel way. And that's why in the COVID response, if you look at many of these other websites that are producing modeling results, COVID Act Now in the United States or RT Live, these are done by data scientists. These, these aren't just epidemiologists. These are data scientists who are figuring out how to get data, bring it together, the COVID tracking project, all these things. And we're seeing now that they're combining, some of these data scientists already have PhDs in epidemiology and they've just gone into other places, but they're also combining with people who are traditional at home is academia and they're coming up with very novel new approaches. And that's, that's what's gonna carry the wave at the end of the day, is that truly interdisciplinary approach of, of, of super unique people. Wow, thank you, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Eric Arthur asks, hi, DJ, my boss has uh, this, uh, his favorite quote that data has no emotions and that you should look at what the data says, but sometimes I do not agree with him. Is there a moment when you have to attach some emotions to data? I think we, you know, when we say data has no emotions, I think it's one of these things where we're trying to actually be objective. I think that's the, the real tenor. And so being objective is so critical because we can't just say we're only trying to be, we have to be balanced. We have to be really what, what, what my dad used to talk or talks about is this idea of being intellectually honest, intellectually honest, being like, are we really looking at this problem from all sides and really understanding those unique challenges? That is the critical component. The question of how we communicate, the place where this breaks apart with, with saying data has no emotion, is how do we make sure that someone is ready to truly receive the information? And what is the conduit? And if we take that, take that out, then we run into challenges. And we also run the risk of implementing or imparting bias when we do it. And we need to be very careful about that as well. And so the way I try to look at it when I look at these things is to be holistic in our approach, to truly be holistic in, in how we look at the problem, the impact of it, and how do we actually find a way to use this data to add value and do more with it. And that sometimes requires emotion to be inserted into it because we need that to get a response. But we need to understand the pros and cons of doing it. We need to do it with, with that. And I think that's, there's, a, there's a balance between these things of how do we really make sure that we're not just advocating in lieu of, of being understanding these other aspects of, of what might be downside impacts of, of the way we may be studying or analyzing the data. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Um, to finish off, I wanted to say a huge thank you. And uh, many of uh, the people here have been following your journey from uh, LinkedIn to the article on um, Harvard Business Review to the White House to now Devoted Health, now COVID. What's next for you? Where, where 
is your journey taking you next from here? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm still with Devoted Health and, and still very focused on that. And, and, and so I'm now back transitioning uh, from, from really being in this phase one, as I mentioned, for COVID to back to Devoted, spending a lot of time on that. But I also have some night and weekend jobs where I still will stay very focused also on the COVID response, as well as a number of issues, including criminal justice reform, um, organ donation, and a few other problems that, that are there. What I, I'm most passionate about, honestly, is us as a collective team. You're all on the data science team, and we all need to find new ways to push this forward. And that's the most powerful part of the journey for me is how do we do more together? And so, you know, my my day fundamentally starts with how can I, what can I do to make this world a little bit better? And, and, and my personal mission statement is what's needed to make this today and the future better for our kids and our kids kids and i think if we all kind of have a model version of that we're going to find a different set of priorities and how we prioritize what is, are we working on the most important thing that we possibly could right now is this the most important thing that we can why why are we spending time together because what you all are doing is important to me you are a community and by me, if I can impart a little bit of what my experiences are and it's helpful to you, that's a win for my kids, my kids' kids, and hopefully your kids, all of your kids, future kids, and you, future kids' kids. That's a win to me. And, and that's, that's, that's how I prioritize my time. That's how I prioritize what I'm doing each day. Thank you. That's very, very inspiring. And I'm looking at the comments and the... Uh, in the event, they're exploding. Everybody's saying a huge thank you. There's literally dozens, if not hundreds, of people thanking for this session. And I also would like to thank you for being part of this community and helping uh, us be inspired with your example. Thank you very much for joining us today, DJ. Thank you all. Thanks for having me today.